Richard. Hi. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so I basically have disclosures that I work with every vendor and both uh, are actually all three drug companies. So again, we now have FDA approval uh, of sulfur hexafluoride uh, lipid type A microspheres. Um, so I think a lot of people are now starting to use this. We also have reimbursement that we'll talk about as we go through this course today. Um, so I think we really are using this a lot more and more and more centers are trying to learn to use this. And I really consider this an, an, an addition to our imaging toolbox that we use. So we don't use it in every patient, but there are a lot of patients that we can select that will really benefit from using ultrasound contrast. And the advantages to ultrasound contrast are listed here. Um, we can go through these. So there's no renal or hepatic toxicity. So we can use these safely in patients with renal failure or renal obstruction. It's a real-time assessment of vascularity. So we can see, visualize all phases of enhancement at a very high frame rate versus the snapshots we see in MR and CT. And we have the best temporal resolution in cross-sectional imaging. And you'll see that this is very important in liver, like an FNH, where we always see the spoke wheel appearance, or where we don't usually miss it on CT and MR because of the timing. Um, and we'll show you some other timing issues that occur um, that allow us to see things that we don't see on MR and CT. We get the contrast only images Andre has talked about. So we have excellent uh, background subtraction. So we can see very small amounts of enhancement, which can be volume average in CT and MR. And this is very critical in indeterminate renal masses that have septations, because we often can, with ultrasound contrast, can see small little berries, for lack of a better term, hanging off the septations that are tumor nodules. And these may be a millimeter, and we can see them very well in ultrasound. We don't see them at all at CT and MR because they're volume enhanced. A narrow ultrasound beam, again, improves visualization of these small structures, such as septations and mural nodules, and gives us increased uh, spatial resolution. No ionizing radiation, so we have a very safe profile, very important in pediatric patients, and those patients that have conditions that require multiple examinations over time. These are true vascular agents, so there's no extravasation of contrast into this interstitium as in CT and MR, and this may lead to improved quantification. There are a few cases where tumors may leak contrast in CT and MR, which don't leak uh, with this in uh, ultrasound, and I'm sure Dr. Wilson will talk about this when she's discussing livers, because um, this can give some confusion into the interpretation, particularly of cholangiocarcinomas. They have a short half-life. Uh, we can destroy the bubbles. We can give multiple injections. Um, you can give basically as much contrast as you need. Uh, when the, well, we'll talk about the package insert, um, that gives us a limit. But really, we have given a lot more. So when we did phase two trials for one of the contrast agents, one of the doses was 45 times the dose we use now, and no one had problems. So you should feel very comfortable in doing multiple injections if you require them. So when we do interventional procedures, like an RFA or a cryo, sometimes we have to give more than the package dose. And I think that's fine uh, to do. You should feel very comfortable with that. This is a portable exam, so you can do this in the ER, the intensive care unit, or bedside, so you don't have to bring a patient down for a CT uh, from the intensive care unit. And a lot of times you can go solve these problems, although you may not find that as an advantage if you're the ultrasound person going up bringing the machine, um, but it does help the patient. Um, Ability to perform the examination without sedation. So very important, again, when pediatric patients, we have a very high frame rate. So even if the child is moving over the long time in the high frame where we have, you usually will be able to make a diagnosis. So in MR and CT, you're sedating these patients, so you can probably get away without having to do the sedation by using ultrasound with contrast. Um, you can use this to uh, uh, perform an exam in flexible positions. So if you have a patient that can't be put flat for a CT or an MR, we can do these patients in a wheelchair uh, or in other positions if they uh, can't move. Um, again, very helpful. No metal interference, so we don't have to worry uh, about that. That may patient may not be able to get an MR. Um, there's really a workflow improvement. We, get, we are looking at the exam. We can make the diagnosis. We can decide if we need a second in dose. We can decide if we need to look somewhere else at the time we're doing the examination. Um, low cost. 
um, and improve visualization of, again, of very small amounts of contrast, at least in our practice, uh, that's a very important uh, factor. Um, these agents are better tolerated than CT and MR, uh, fewer and less adverse side effects. They're not nephrotoxic and are safe for use in renal failure and renal obstruction. And we can use these to uh, evaluate the microcirculation and quantify perfusion using a bubble uh, destruction and reperfusion technique that um, we probably won't talk a lot about today, but that's kind of an advanced feature of things you can use. And if you want, you can look at the, the EFSIM or the WUFM guidelines, uh, and there are a couple other papers that go over that in detail. Of course, the disadvantage is you need an IV, and I think most sonographers uh, think this is a, a cruel thing for them to have to start an IV. Um, in our practice, the seat, everyone except the ultrasound sonographers um, actually start IV, so it's really not a problem in our, our private practice, um, but you may find it difficult if you're in a hospital setting and the ultrasound is somewhat separated uh, from the other group and you don't have a nurse. Um, the ICUS is recommending that in ultrasound schools they start training to start IVs because I think this is going to be a technique um, that's going to hang around for a long time and sonographers um, should embrace this uh, and learn how to do that. You do need two sets of hands because things happen very fast, so you can't inject and then scan. You need to have uh, the sonographer in the right position ready to go when the contrast is injected. Um, so you need that person to be there at least during the injection. Um, Andre talked about PAX issues. Um, we may save long clips uh, sometimes, but most systems will allow you then to edit the clip or just select selected images from that clip that we send to the PAC. So we don't necessarily send all the information we collect to the PACs. If you want, you can get a four terabyte drive, attach it to the USB port that all machines have, and you can send all that data to that if you want to save that data. So you're doing research, or particularly when you're starting, if you want to save a lot of information but don't want to send it to the PAC, that's one way of doing that. And obviously you have to buy the additional contrast-specific software uh, for your machine. Um, Andre went over um, these micro bubbles, and again, just to briefly say, these are about the size of a red blood cell. They don't extravasate, and I think um, Stephanie will talk in liver. There are some indications of, or applications where we may get a little bit different answer than MR and CT. Um, again, they have the nonlinear response at low MI. At high MI, they bust, which is helpful for us because we can eliminate the bubbles if we want to give a second injection. Um, and these are true intervascular agents, so they're not excreted by the kidney, so we do not see any contrast in the collecting system. Um, again, Andre went over these. I'm not going to go over them again. Um, this is just a table showing the three agents that are approved in the United States. Uh, Lumison is a, uh, called Sonoview in the rest of the world, is approved for um, liver and, um, and pediatric and adult patients. Um, Definity and Optison right now are only approved for cardiology but can be used off-label for other applications as we use Lumison off-label for doing kidneys, for example. Uh, one thing I want to point out, if you do read the insert label, you'll notice that the doses are quite high compared to uh, what we use now. So these studies that were used to get these drugs approved by the FDA happened 10 or more years ago, um, and at that time our equipment was not as good. So right now, the doses that are listed in the package insert are way too high, and you're going to get a lot of shadowing artifacts. So um, starting at half of this dose is probably appropriate, and in some machines you may need to use a quarter dose. So again, um, depending on your vendor, ultrasound vendor, you may want to ask them what a more standard dose would be uh, for their machine. And again, the machines continue to improve, and we're starting to use less and less contrast, and the agents are lasting longer and longer. And again, Lumison does have a pediatric application for um, livers and intravesicular use that I'm sure Dr. Costa will talk about, and he'll uh, go over the dosing. And again, I'm sure that the package dosing is way too high. So if you're going to start this in your practice, what do you need to do? You need to have that contrast-specific software on your uh, machine, and all the major vendors have this. Usually it's on a higher-end system. You need to buy the contrast agent. Um, you may be surprised that at, uh, your hospital probably has these agents already, but you don't know it because cardiology may be using them. Um, so you can check. 
um, that. Uh, if you uh, want one of the other agents, you may have to go through the pharmacy committee uh, to get them approved. Again, in your practice, you have to decide how you're going to start an IV. And again, I'm in private practice. We're in a relatively small office, so there's always somebody around that we can grab walking by the room when we need an IV to get it started. But in your center, that may be an issue, so you have to work that out uh, in yourself. But obviously, you're starting IVs in CT and MR, so there isn't a way in your uh, in facility that you should be able to do this. And again, you need two sets of hands. And again, we just grab somebody that's walking down the hall. You may want to have a more formal uh, method of doing that in your practice. So Andre went over this, but let me just briefly go over it again. So we need this contrast-specific software that allows low MI techniques for our dynamic evaluation of contrast in all phases. There are pulsing sequences using pulse inversion, pulse modulations, and combinations. You don't have to understand these. Uh, most vendors have one, maybe two different settings that you can use. Um, the default setting is usually the best. They may have another setting, uh, which may, um, in some places, called CHI uh, versus CPS, that may have a little more increased resolution, but not depth penetration. So again, this is somewhat vendor specific, but the default that they have is probably the best place for you to start. Um, and once you feel comfortable, if you want to advance, you can talk to them about using some of these other sequences. And again, as Andre said, these sequences take advantage of the linear response. Um, and here's um, a similar um, scheme than what Andre said. We send in the basis of the pulse inversion, the most simple uh, technique where we send in two pulses out of phase from each other. The linear signals, when we add these together, will subtract and have no signal but the nonlinear will give different responses, so we will have signal. Um, and you'll notice instead of adding the out of phase images, if we subtract them, we now have a B mode image. So that some vendors use that as our real time B mode image. And I think it's important that you realize that although that B mode image you see may not be as beautiful as you have just non contrast doing B mode, because Sono CT, harmonics, and other things are shut off. It is truly a real time image from the same uh, information that you're getting to do the contrast image. So you can be very confident uh, that you're looking at the same location. Um, and again, we talked about IV access. I think when I've talked to people, this seems to be their most a difficult thing for them to implement in their practice. Again, it varies by institution of how you're going to do this. Um, it actually varies by state in the U.S. as to who can start IVs uh, and who can push drugs. So in Ohio and I think New York, sonographers are not allowed to push the contrast agent. Why? It's a long story. Um, but um, you need to check. So I can't give you a general rule because it may vary from state to state. You want to use at least a 20-gauge IV if possible. Again, when we increase the pressure, the bubbles bust. So if we have a very small IV, and you're going to force the more pressure as you're injecting. So the, the larger the IV, the better. In pediatrics, you may need to use a 22-gauge, and that's fine. But just recognize that the, the pressure is going to be different if you inject the same. So you may have to inject slower so you don't bust the bubbles if you have a smaller IV. And again, we talked about the three-way stop cock, uh, which is very useful. And we uh, always keep the contrast parallel so it doesn't go around the bend and the saline perpendicular. Informed consent. So now that we have approval in the United States, we don't actually get a specific informed consent. So when we were doing this and we didn't have approval, we did get written informed consent from the patient. So now we just do whatever we do for CT and MR. In our practice, the patient signs uh, informed consent at the front desk. Um, so we don't have them sign anything in the ultrasound room. If we're doing things off-label, so when we do renals, uh, EVARs, or other things that we're going to talk about today, we usually mention to the patient that we're using it off-label, and we usually say we're giving you the same dose as we would use in a liver. We're just putting the probe in a different location. So again, we don't really document it, but we do let inform patients that it's off-label. Obviously, if you're doing a research study, you need to have an IRB-approved uh, IRB. So let's just go over briefly how we're going to perform the exam. It's really important to do a very good unenhanced exam, locate the lesion or lesions that you're very interested in, and what you want to do is you want to find an image plane where the lesion remains in the field of view as they're breathing. 
because we're going to look at the liver for five or seven minutes. Most patients cannot hold their breath that long. So what you'd like to do is find the lesion and have your probe so that the lesion, when the patient's breathing, will stay in the field of view so you can see how the enhancement occurs. <coughs> so again, you want to roll the patient. You want to uh, try to get the lesion as close to the skin surface for other reasons that we're going to talk about. And you want to do that while you're doing your B-mode image. My sonographer likes to use a magic marker and mark the patient when she gets them in the right position so that if she has to go back there very quickly because these exams are going to happen very fast, she knows where to go. So um, that's one other little trick that we use. Um, and again, sometimes you can't do that if the lesion is in the dome, but you're going to have to do your best. You're probably going to have gaps. So you'll see the lesion with contrast, then you'll lose the lesion. So it's a little bit harder. But if do your best to try to get the lesion to stay uh, in the field of view throughout the imaging. You're going to activate the drug, as Andre uh, said, depending on which agent. All these agents will settle. So after we activate the drug, if, if it's a, some time between injection, we continue to shake. If we've pulled it up into the syringe, something happened and we're delayed, we take the syringe off and we shake the syringe. So always look at the syringe and see if you see layering of the contrast agents. If there is, all you need to do is shake it to resuscitate those bubbles. Again, you're going to activate your contrast-specific software. Then you're going to inject the drug. Again, we use about one cc a second. We're going to then inject the saline. The timer starts when we inject the saline. I like to inject 10 cc's of saline. Other people like to inject five. Uh, I'm not sure that it makes a difference. I think uh, in patients that have very poor cardiac output in doing 10 cc's, I think gives us a nicer bolus. We're again, start the timer when we inject the saline, and then you're gonna save clips or images, and again, um, when you start, I think you like to save as much information as possible, and that's fine, um, but as you get more experience, you'll try to save less images uh, because of PAX problems, and again, most vendors will allow you to save these long clips. You don't have to send them to the PAX. You can crop the clips to the important areas, or you can select out images that you're going to send to the PACs. You can store these images on the machine in the, the hard drive for some, some time if you need to go back to them. If you want to store them for a longer period of time, like I said, you can get a four terabyte drive for $100 now, plug it into the USB port and just send all that raw data over to the USB port and then you can always uh, rebring that image back into the system and look at it again. Um, again, we've talked about this, and I want to go over it in, in detail, uh, again, to bore you to death, but this is uh, basically the same as uh, Andre had, uh, where we use this three-way stopcock. One thing that's important, these all have this little off thing. Um, you know, we like to turn, put it on so when we're changing things, we don't have blood coming out the ends, but you have to remember to open it when you're doing the injection. Because if you have it closed and you try to inject, you're going to put a lot of pressure. You're going to bust the bubble. So uh, remember that. And then we'll talk a little bit during my quiz um, that you have to know how to turn that little blue knob right. Because if you turn it the wrong way, you're going to have problems. Um, again, Andre went over this, so I'm not going to discuss it. Um, again, the doses. Again, this is the package in for, for Lumison. And I just put this in here since it's the only approved drug. But again, these doses are way too high. We can't use these. We'll have shadowing. You'll have very poor image quality. Um, I think you should start at about a half dose. You may have to even go lower depending on uh, which vendor's machine you have. In terms of scanning parameters, I think all the vendor's scanning parameters are really good. The only thing you really need to do is adjust the gain when you start. You want that contrast image to be relatively black, except in areas where you have um, like subcutaneous fat, the diaphragm, that are very echogenic. You should see those echogenic structures. And again, I think as you gain experience, you'll have a better idea of where you want to go. You would prefer not to have much signal over the liver if you're doing a liver exam or the kidney, because that is going to end up being noise in your image uh, when you uh, do your injection. Um, and again, we really like to use the, the tool display because it allows you to make sure you're in the right location, that you're over the lesion and you're staying there, um, and to confirm things because some things may be ISO intense uh, after contrast, and you may not see them on the contrast image, but you can still see them 
on the B-mode image and vice versa. Again, um, scanning parameters, you do your best B-mode image beforehand uh, to make your diagnosis from the B-mode image. But remember, when you turn on contrast, a lot of those advanced features will not be there. So that B-mode image is going to be a low MI with no features. So it is going to be a poor quality image, which is fine. You only are using that to make sure you're on the lesion location. You're going to not use that for diagnosis. You're always going to use your real B-mode image to make uh, your B-mode diagnosis. And again, really critical, spend some time on the B-mode image to find the lesion, find a plane that the lesion is going to stay when the patient's breathing um, so that it stays in the field of view as you're doing the dose. Um, you can give second dose. You can give more than that if you want to. Um, but after you look at your images, if there was a problem or you need to do a second lesion, you need, you're not happy with the quality of the images, you can give a second dose. And before you give the second dose, you may want to eliminate all the bubbles so you have a fresh bolus to see how the arterial phase looks. And in that case, what you'd like to do is not use the button that says flash because that will give you high MI, but only for a few frames. So you'll bust a little bit of bubbles, but not all the bubbles. The best thing to do is get out of contrast, go into color Doppler, put a wide field of view and put it over the aorta or the heart. That will burst bubbles relatively fast. Um, and you'll also, I like the color Doppler because the bubbles enhance our color Doppler signal. So you'll see blooming from the contrast bubbles and when that starts to disappear, you know that the, con the number of bubbles has decreased and then you can go back into the contrast setting uh, and you'll have no bubbles uh, on your image so you can do your second injection. Um, again, for saving images, I think um, we'll talk about LIRADs. Their recommended imaging for liver, I think, is probably what you're going to want to use. Uh, but again, when you're starting, I think you may feel more comfortable to film a little bit more, um, and that's fine. But as you gain experience, you should move to that type of imaging sequence um, because it's really appropriate. It'll make the bubbles last a little bit longer, um, and I think it's now the standard. Um, and again, most vendors will allow you not to send everything to PAX, but you can select um, images or select images from a cine clip or decrease the cine clip just so you send the appropriate information. So again, let's just review what are we going to do when we start the exam. Number one, do your B-mode image, locate the area of concern. Identify the best patient position for the lesion to be near to the transducer and make sure that the lesion stays in the field of view during breathing as much as you can. You're going to start the IV, and it can be started before you do the B mode. We usually wait until after the B mode to start that. Um, reposition the patient back to where you know the lesion was. And again, like I said, my sonographer always has her Sharpie, and when she's doing the B mode, she's marking on the patient. So if she needs to go back and roll the patient after you start the IV, she knows exactly where to go. You're going to activate the contrast agent inject the contrast agent, as we said, with the dose we've talked about. You're going to inject the saline, and at the same time, you start the timer. So we usually have who's ever injecting say, contrast in, saline started, and when we hear saline started, the sonographer puts the, pushes the timer button. Um, continued scanning and recording uh, based on that protocol that we'll talk about as we go through today. Um, and again, one thing I like to do that I'm sure Dr. Wilson will mention, if you're looking for metastases after you've made the diagnosis, metastases kind of show up as black holes. So it's really nice after you've characterized the lesion you were worried about, you can screen the whole liver if there's still bubbles left to look for other black holes that may be additional metastases. And I'm sure you'll hear more about that as the day goes on. Again, you're going to review the case and determine if you need to give a second injection. If you want to give a second injection, use a high MI technique to destroy the majority of the bubbles and repeat as above. And again, select what you'd like to go to the PACs. So just as a general rule as you're starting, what patients are appropriate? Patients that are renally impaired that require a contrast examination are obviously a very big uh, component. And I think anyone that has cancer really deserves a contrast study to stage the liver looking for metastases.
patients with CT and or MR contrast allergy or other contraindications, or CT or MR do not answer the clinical question or have conflicting results. So we see this a lot, particularly in focal nodular hyperplasia where the images don't match uh, or uh, in other lesions. So we're kind of used as the tiebreaker, if you will. It's important to know when there's no enhancement present. So things when we're doing RFAs or cryos or TACE, and you want to make sure that there's no residual tumor left, this is a really great exam because you can see very small amounts. And that ability to subtract out background tissue is really critical in these areas to look for that small amount uh, of enhancement. And we actually use this technique when we perform the examinations because at the time we do our first ablation, we give a dose of contrast, and I can tell you if there's residual tumor. So then we can reposition the needles. We can reposition the needles while we see the contrast so we can be confident of where we're putting in the needles, and we may talk about that a little bit more as we go through today. Uh, to decrease radiation dose, so again, I'm sure Dr. Kuss is gonna talk uh, a lot about the, the ability for us to do a lot of pediatric examinations and not have to subject them to radiation. If you need a portable exam, um, and again, for pediatric patients, mostly to reduce the, the need for sedation uh, for people that otherwise would need sedation. Um, I'm just gonna give you a brief overview, I'm, where as we go through the course, you'll have a lot more uh, information on how to interpret these things, but just to give you kind of a background and a foundation as we go through to get you prepared. Um, so contrast washout in liver is indicative of a malignant lesion with a very high um, specificity and sensitivity. Globular peripheral enhancement is diagnostic of a hemangioma as it is in CT and MR. And FNH has the spoke wheel arterial rapid intense filling and becomes iso intense again as we would see in CT and MR. But again, our ability to have high frame rates and continuous scanning allows us to see these features that are often missed on CT and MR. So here's my little schematic um, of the things that we usually see in practice. Um, you'll notice there's a red line. Above the red line are benign lesions, and the, the important thing here is you'll notice in the delayed fade, these are usually iso-intense. The malignant lesions are on the bottom, and the key feature here is that they wash out, and they wash out differently uh, in terms of time and intensity, and as we go through the course today, uh, we'll go over that. So here's a uh, FNH, you can see the spoke wheel appearance and the central scar, um, hyper intense compared to the normal liver in this arterial phase. But one thing I wanna point out that you should also know is we can, if you don't see the spoke wheel because it goes so fast, this may happen in flash angiomas also, it happens so fast you don't see it, you know, we can go back and we can screen and go back and look frame to frame to see of these changes. And again, FNHs flow from the center out. And I can go back and I can show you that this flow came from the center out. So don't feel like you, you can't look at the clip frame by frame. All these things that happen very fast, usually in the arterial phase, it's very easy for you to go back. Um, again, I don't wanna go over um, the, these things in great detail because we'll get much detailed uh, lectures as we go through. But again, we're gonna look for washout uh, in lesions uh, in the liver. And again, you'll hear that as we go through. And just to save time, uh, I'm gonna go through that. And again, here's an HCC, hyper-enhancing in the arterial phase with mild, slow washout. And again, um, we'll go over that in a lot more detail. And I'm sure Stephanie has phenomenal images to show you when she goes over the liver. Um, there's some pediatric publications, and again, show that we were actually uh, quite good in detecting uh, and characterizing lesions even in the pediatric population. Um, so uh, we do a lot more kidney examinations than we do liver examinations, and our urologists um, really think we're better than CT and MR. <coughs> Key things here, the ultrasound contrast agents are not excreted, so you're not gonna see enhancement in the collecting system or in the renal pelvis. Benign cystic lesions, regardless of their Bosniak score, do not have any enhancement. Uh, malignant cystic lesions have enhancement of the cyst wall, septations, or nodules, um, and RCC tends to have rapid enhancement and washout. So again, a similar kind of imaging uh, a table compared to uh, liver, so different. So um, here, we basically have a black and white. 
if it doesn't enhance, it's benign with very, very high confidence levels. Um, if it does enhance, high probability of being malignant. There's a couple benign things that uh, we'll talk about when I give the renal talk that you may see. Um, but a little bit simpler, I think, to image uh, or, or interpret than uh, livers. Um, this was from our paper in our first 1,000 or so cases uh, that we used that we've modified slightly um, from that. But basically, again, no blood flow. It's benign with extremely high um, rate uh, of accuracy, essentially 100%. Um, if there is contrast, there's a few benign things, but those mostly turn out to be uh, malignant. Just other things, endoleaks, inflammatory bowel disease, pancreas, prostate intervention, cardiology. This is being used in many, many applications. Some of these are still research, such as looking at ovarians, ovaries for ovarian cancer. Research continues. So I think um, this is my interpretation that I think is going to end up being in the SRU guidelines, and depending on if everybody agrees with me. But if we look at the things that have been looked at, uh, a level of 1A is the highest level of incidence, meaning there are many m m papers out that are prospective. There's many meta-analyses that show that it works. And then five would be the worst that there's one case report. So if you look, I think for liver, we do great in characterizing lesions. There's not as many papers in detection of lesions compared to CT and MR, but it's clear that we can detect additional lesions sometimes that we don't see with MR. Guidance for procedures, again, very well documented. Kidneys, again, for characterization as well as guidance for um, treatment, um, very helpful. Um, and then when we go to things like pancreas and spleen, there are some studies that we see some advantage, uh, but really not kind of mainstream yet. Um, small bowel, a lot of evidence. Um, and again, I think Stephanie will go over uh, that in great detail. We think that is an application that's here and we understand pretty well. And then all these others, um, uh, scrotum, ovaries, breast, parathyroid, prostate. People have looked at it. We don't have enough information, I think, to be really confident on giving you that you should be doing this routinely. Um, vascular, looking for endo leaks is really great. Um, using it as a Doppler enhancement is very good. So looking at vascular structures that you're having a hard time seeing with color Doppler, um, you know, this is a very good indication. So this is just one example. Um, this actually was a patient I did a renal RFA on who came back for his follow-up exam, but he also had an aortoiliac stent graft that they were following with unenhanced CTs. Um, and my very astute sonographer realized when she, we injected bubbles, uh, there was a one centimeter gap between the stent and that bubbles were pouring into the um, aneurysm. And that although the CT for many years was stable, he had a huge uh, type 1 endo leak. Um, he actually had an angiogram uh, at a uh, world famous center. They decided this had to be a type 2 leak and glued him, which obviously didn't help. Um, and during all of their tries to get this to stop, put him in renal failure. So he's now on dialysis, um, but you can see, we can see these. And again, we've got a very, very good advantage that we have very high frame rates. This happened very quick, but now I can cine back and I can see where the contrast comes from. Again, big advantage compared to other things. The cost, we now have reimbursement. I don't, we haven't had enough time for me to know exactly what we're gonna get reimbursed. We have a relatively good RVU, uh, but again, that may not mean anything until we actually see what we get reimbursed. But in general, we're going to be cheaper than CT and MR. There was one study that um, was done in Europe, and you can see the difference in cost. There were about half the cost of CT and MR, and I, I don't know of how many centers in the United States are charging uh, Two hundred dollars for an MR with contrast, so uh, the, the, maybe even a little bit uh, more. I think another thing that's very important is uh, Dr. Grant from uh, UCLA or USC. You know, pushed the paper. They have a county hospital that's kind of um, that they get X number of dollars that they've got to deal with the patients, and you've got USC, a high tech university that's fee for service. Um, and what they found is they're using an enormous amount of contrast in the community hospital because they're saving tons of money. There was a huge backlog in CT and MRs that he can answer the majority of those questions. And I think in the literature, if you see a liver lesion, 85% of the time you can answer the question with ultrasound contrast alone. So again, 
County Hospital, quick, saving money, great. UCLA, where it's fee-for-service, not using very much because they don't want to decrease the number of MRs. So again, I think we're going to have this challenge uh, as we go on. Um, again, we can use this for urinary reflux, and I'm not going to say much because uh, Dr. Garg is going to give you a wonderful talk on that. So again, when do we use contrast? So we use it when we consider it can help a patient. So renally impaired patient requiring contrast, patients with contrast uh, allergies and CT and MR. CT and MR don't answer the question or there's a conflict, and it's when, when it's important to know there's no flow present so after an RFA. We have some problems with our oncologists sending us liver cases because right now the guidelines for workup don't include ultrasound contrast. So they feel a little uncomfortable sending us this is a first line technique because in the protocols that they have to work up, it's CT and MR are listed. So hopefully, I think IGIS is going to make some changes and hopefully uh, get into those guidelines so that they feel a little more comfortable that they can use ultrasound contrast. Um, and again, there's both WOFM and FSM guidelines. The uh, World Federation of Ultrasound and Medicine guidelines are going to be updated this year. Um, so those probably will be out either later this year or earlier next year. We'll have an SRU document uh, going over um, North American experience and what to use and how to do it. Um, and hopefully that will be out also by the end of the year. Um, obviously, um, training is going to be very important, and you're here today. Um, ICUS offers many, many courses in different um, settings uh, that are very helpful. Um, some of the vendors may give you a specific place to go to watch. I think it's very useful for you to go to a center and watch some cases being done. Um, it gives you a little more confidence when you start of how to inject, how to mix the drug, and although we can show you images and video clips, I think you feel more comfortable when you see it done in, in person. Um, there are also training courses in Europe if you need a vacation as well as uh, some education. <coughs> It's important to talk to your referring doctors, and like I said, our urologists and nephrologists are our biggest referrers, um, again, for workup of renal masses by the urologists, but as nephrologists that need a contrast study that know their patients can't get contrast C2 MR. So those are people you want to talk to. Again, obviously, your uh, hepatologists uh, and uh, other doctors dealing with the liver are going to be very important also. Like I said, in our practice, we've had a little bit of problems getting them to use this frequently. We only use it to solve problems. So CT and MR is still being done as the first line. But when there's an issue or a question or things are not um, considered to be 100% uh, sure, then we, we kind of add this. So hopefully that will change uh, as time goes on. Basically, there's no contraindications to use these except for hypersensitivity to their own, and that goes for all these agents. Um, not been studied well in pregnancy, um, but people have used it and there's been no side effects. So in our practice, if a pregnant patient needs an exam, we make sure we document that this is the exam to do, um, that we've talked about this with the referring doctors, um, that we don't have any other solution to use. So as, I think as long as we document that, um, I think we feel very safe uh, in doing these in pregnancy. As Andre said, we often have people complain of a, maybe a little bit of a backache or a headache, um, usually resolves quickly within a minute. Um, I think we've dosed probably three, somewhere between three and 4,000 patients in our series of things we've done. And I think we've had two or three patients that have had symptoms that were not severe, but were still present at the end of the exam. And we usually watch them and have vital signs. And usually, again, in another 15 or 20 minutes, they resolve. So we've never had a major complication, um, although they can happen. So you do need to be prepared uh, for that. And that slide is old, so we're not going to talk about it. Uh, we'll talk about billing a little bit later. So uh, ultrasound contrast has increased sensitivity and specificity over a non-contrast exam. Similar sensitivities to CT and MR uh, may have increased uh, sensitivity to CT and MR. It's probably less expensive than CT and MR. Um, and we can differentiate malignant pathology lesions based on the rapidity of washout, as we'll talk about in the liver. Uh, lectures. An ultrasound is a safe exam uh, 
uh, without ionizing radiation, um, can be used in patients with renal impairment and obstruction, and used in patients with contraindications for enhanced CT or MR. Real-time vascular assessment and narrow slice thickness are advantages over CT and MR, and we can characterize focal liver lesions and indeterminate renal lesions with accuracy similar, if not better, than CT and MR, which we'll talk about as we go through the course. And again, I just consider this a important addition to our imaging toolbox. Thank you. Richard, that was great. Now, do, does anybody have any question or comment or anything about this? I think it's a real important thing. Where are we going and what are we doing? Um, I'll make um, a, a comment a little. So um, one of the things that Dr. Barr very nicely pointed out, of course, is that there is no doubt that in the many, many, many patients who have renal failure who are imaged every day, in America and all around the world that if you can co convince your nephrologists and your inpatient clinicians and your um, people who look after these patients that CUS has a benefit, this is really a great thing. And um, so in my own department, we did a lovely study that I really like that where we published this showing the difference in what you can see on an unenhanced CT or MR scan as compared to what you can contribute if you do ultrasound and then do CEUS. So I absolutely agree with you that that's just a great thing and so you can kind of feel as you're going along that your clinicians become aware of that and that when they get, because a lot of patients who go for a CT scan, they actually go with the belief that they're going to have a contrast enhanced exam and it's not until the the screening um, process that they use shows that their creatinine is too high. So what happens is, in most institutions, is that the CT scan is converted from a contrast enhanced CT scan to an unenhanced scan. And then the report is, uh, always has a proviso that they could be missing things because they don't have that great benefit of contrast. And so those cases, if we can get them and do them, that will make a really a huge benefit. But having said that, although so I'm a big proponent that that's a great thing. So now for me though, I've been doing my practice with um, an approved contrast agent. So I live in Canada, I'm a Canadian. And so we approved perfutrin microspheres for use um, for liver imaging in 2002. And so I was in Toronto at that time and we'd done the clinical trials that were done before the approval. So we really started to do patients in the late 1990s actually. And so with a bubble approval since 2002, and Richard knows this and everybody does, so I really push it in my own institution. And so although we, I agree with you about the renal failure, I think that the really great thing that happens, and I hope it will happen for everybody that has practices starting in the United States, is that the clinicians start to understand where you can contribute to their patient's diagnosis and management. And so then you get most of your referrals actually from clinicians who are really asking you questions. So they know, for example, the patient has a renal mass or they have a liver mass and they want to know like for the characterization that's afforded from CUS. And then in addition, amazingly enough, even your CT and MR colleagues when you do liver studies, which is my real favorite thing. So they start to realize that we make significant contributions in so many patients. And so then they start to send you those patients as well. And so I really think that um, the, the future and the applications are, that's bright. And maybe one of the reasons it works better in Canada is because they don't pay us much anyways. <laughs> 